Hello and welcome to this War Scholar video. When it comes to modern naval warfare, aircraft carriers have a huge hold on popular imagination. The United States Navy was very successful in utilizing aircraft carriers in World War II and so might it be said were the Japanese, except for the fact that they had to fight the Americans. Unfortunately, the work of the British Royal Navy in developing the aircraft carrier before World War II is not often considered. David Hobbs is making the effort to remind us all of British aircraft carrier development and operations. I spoke with him about his book, The Dawn of Carrier Strike. The following is a shortened version of the full written interview, which can be found at warscholar.org. How did you become interested in studying and writing on the subject of your book? He writes, I have always been fascinated by the Royal Navy's fleet air arm and have written extensively about its history. This book fills the gap between my earlier books on the British Pacific Fleet and the Royal Navy's Air Service, both published by Seafirth. What are the major themes of this book? He writes, I describe the continuing development of naval aviation between 1918 and 1940, culminating in the first carrier strike operations ever carried out by any Navy. I use as an example the naval career of Lieutenant William Paulette Bill Lucy, DSORN. He was the first British fighter ace of the Second World War and led the first airstrike to sink a major enemy warship, the German cruiser Königsberg. After World War I, how much emphasis did the British government put on supporting the advancement of carrier operations and technology? Was there any post-World War I war weariness that affected the Royal Navy's development of new tactics and techniques? He writes, World War I war weariness had no discernible effect on Royal Navy tactics and techniques as they evolved from 1919 onwards. The Admiralty had invested heavily in aircraft prior to the armistice as a means of taking the fight to the enemy in his harbors, locating enemy ships at sea, and countering the U-boat threat. After the war, the Admiralty wanted to go on developing aircraft as a means of maintaining its edge over any navy that might pose a potential threat to the British Empire. The problem was the existence of the newly independent Air Force. How much tension and how much cooperation was there between the RAF and the Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm in developing flight technology and operations? I imagine resources were limited in the period between 1918 and 1940, and the two services might have been very competitive in the political arena. He writes, the period of dual control which afflicted the fleet air arm between 1918 and 1937 severely limited the development of aviation for naval purposes. The U.S. and Japanese navies suffered no similar restriction, and although they were far behind Britain in capability in 1919, both drew well ahead by 1939. Who were the major leaders in the Royal Navy as far as pushing the advancement of carrier operations forward? He writes, all of them to a certain extent, if I had to single out any by name who were exceptional, they would be Admiral Chatfield, Admiral J.D. Cunningham, Admiral Bell Davies, Admiral Henderson, Admiral Lister, Captain Boyd, and Admiral de Robeck. The whole Royal Navy believed implicitly in the use of aircraft in sea warfare and agreed that it was let down by the RAF and successive governments that failed either to recognize the problem or do anything to remedy it. Are you able to touch on the major engineering changes that occurred in both the aircraft and with the carriers during this period and how effective these changes were? He points out the important changes in aircraft technology, aircraft armament, and aircraft carrier developments, which included the safety barrier, the deck landing control officer, and the starboard side island. Who were the major enemies that the Royal Navy was most worried about and how did that affect how they approached carrier operations? How did these worries change during the interwar period? Until Nazi Germany started to rearm after 1933, Japan was seen as the most likely enemy since it coveted the oil and mineral wealth controlled by Great Britain and the Netherlands in the Far East. What is your next writing project? He writes, My next writing project follows logically on from the dawn of carrier strike and describes the attack by swordfish aircraft from HMS Illustrious on the Italian fleet at Toronto in November 1940 
and naval air warfare in the Mediterranean between 1940 and 1945. What do you hope the book will do for readers? He writes, I hope it will inform the public how much was achieved by the Royal Navy's air arm. Many people think that the leader in carrier aviation was the U.S. Navy. However, much of the development was carried out by the Royal Navy and later adopted by the U.S. Navy. There was also a mistaken view that the Royal Air Force carried out every air combat, but I show that it was the Royal Navy's fleet air arm that had to fight in the sky over Norway in the spring of 1940. In the final chapters, I explained that the German Luftwaffe deployed about 800 combat aircraft to this campaign. They were opposed by a handful of gallant Royal Navy carrier-borne aircrew with about 30 Blackburn SCUA fighters. The entire interview, which expands on points raised here, can be found at warscholar.org and by using the link provided in the video description. Thank you for watching. You can find more videos like this on YouTube at War Scholar 1945. You can find the podcast version of this show on your favorite podcast feed under the title Military History Inside Out. You can find more great military history information at warscholar.org, on Facebook at War Scholar, on Instagram at Chris Alvarez War Scholar, and on Twitter at War Scholar. Please support me by following me on those sites and liking my videos. Thank you.